Hey everybody, welcome to Element. It's good to see you all today. Well, actually not see you today. Um, I think this week is the time that I've led more times with nobody here than with people actually here. So that's fun. Wherever you are, uh, will you stand and sing with us? worship our King and come let us bow at His feet He has done great things and see what our Savior has done and see how His love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things You conquer the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus, our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God You have done great things Faithful through every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. heaven, you conquer the grave, you free every captive, and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things, we dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Shake up all hallelujah, you have done great things. And hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. And break every chain, oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus, our Savior Your name lifted high, oh God You have done great things You have done great things Oh God, you do great Thank you so much for joining us for part of your morning. We are so happy that you're here and I hope that you are off to having a great weekend. Uh, my name is Sarah and these are your morning announcements. If you are new to Element, we like to start off every service by making sure we share what our mission is here. If you're not new, you've heard this a hundred times. In fact, you could probably recite it with me 
which I know sounds cheesy, but I think it would be kind of fun, especially if you have kids in the room. So kids, if you're watching church with your parents right now, look at the words on the screen and say this along with me. At Element, our aim is to glorify God by teaching and living out the scriptures, transforming community into gospel community, and planting churches. Today we are hosting our Digital Connect Party. What does this mean? If you are newer to Element, we want to invite you to come and meet some of our leaders, find out what next steps you can take to get more plugged in or connected around here. Uh, and usually this is a dessert party that we can all gather together for, but of course, um, being conscious of the things happening right now, we are gonna be doing it digitally. So following our third service at 12.30 p.m., you can log into Zoom and meet some of our gospel community leaders and elder, other leaders around here at Element. So we invite you to participate in that. Also, if you are new, uh, we do have a digital connect card. Basically, it's our way to get a little bit of information from you so that we can reach out, welcome you here, and let you know uh, different things that we provide. Another great use for that connect card is actually for prayer. If you are just uh, feeling overwhelmed or lonely or stressed or anxious about everything that's happening, uh, we want to pray with you just like we would in person on a Sunday morning. We want a chance to uh, connect with you and pray for you and pray with you. So we've been doing that as well digitally through phone calls or Zoom calls or things like that. So if you are in need of prayer, please fill out that card, let us know, and we will schedule a one-on-one -on -one prayer session with you guys. That's everything I have for you this morning. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Sorry for the barking dogs and welcome to Element. Bye. adore him praise him angels in the high sun and moon rejoice before him praise him all ye stars of light and praise the Lord for he has spoken world's his mighty voice obey laws which never shall be broken for the guidance he hath made let all creation join the song of praise let every tongue declare his might And we will sing of your goodness and mercy all of our days. And praise the Lord for he is glorious. Never shall his promise fail. God hath made the saints victorious.
Hi everyone, we're the Traumas. We miss seeing you all every week in person and are really looking forward to the time when we can get together in person again once this is all over. Yeah, for us as a family, we definitely uh, miss being there in fellowship with everybody, but we're so much more appreciative now than ever uh, for the community of Element and we are so glad that there's still uh, events and ways to participate, whether it's through eFamilies uh, that's been a lot of fun for us to participate with our kids and let them see that uh, Element is still gathering together um, or even getting together with our GC. So we hope that everybody is enjoying those ways to be involved. And if you're not, we encourage you to um, connect with someone at the church and they'd love to plug you in. Um, anyway, we hope you all have a great week and we miss you. Bye. Bye. So welcome to Elements live stream, whether you're in Colorado, which is where Austin, you know, the, the drummer is, also the Whitakers are there too, uh, Tennessee, which is where the Stanleys got to, Santa Barbara, which is as far as Britt Stanley got because he hurt himself and went into the hospital last week. So if you'd like to pray for him, that would be great. He's in rehab uh, for his leg surgery, uh, Lompoc, Vandenberg Air Force Base, Orchid, Santa Maria, Napomo, Arroyo Grande, Texas. Uh, Alaska, Ohio, Mexico, Kuwait, welcome to you. We're glad that you join us. If you're watching from anywhere else, email us, and I'll throw you at the beginning so you feel like you got said hi to. What's kind of interesting about how these live streams are going right now is we're going to start even calling them not so much live streams, but on-demand viewing because people are watching it whenever they kind of get around to it now. We have uh, a guy I was talking to this week. He's got a couple little kids. He says, I, I can't watch the live stream in the morning, so we watch about 2 p.m. in the afternoon when the kids take a nap. I know somebody else who was talking about how they, they take it on their phone. They open the YouTube app, and they hit play on the way to work and home, so they actually listen on the way to work and the way back, stuff like that. So welcome wherever you are, however you are listening. If you would like to, you can also download this app. It is called Uversion, and in Uversion, you will click on More and then Events. If you're in our local area, we will come up by GPS in your smartphone. If not, type in 93455, and we will come up that way. You will get sermon notes, verses, questions, announcements, everything that really goes with today's message. Now, at this point, if we have like a live gathering, I say, why don't you stand for the reading of God's word? Uh, and I've kind of stopped doing that with just a straight live stream. All I'm saying is this is the reading of God's word. And I had someone ask me about that this week. They said, why don't you have people stand for the reading of God's word anymore? And I said, because most people at home don't. And he goes, well, I really like it. You should have people do that. And I said, do you stand at home? And he goes, well, no. And I go, well, there you go. If you would like to stand for the reading of God's word, you can stand. But this is the reading of God's word. This is Acts 23, verse 12. And when I say stand, it's because we look at God's word with respect. Uh, this is it. It says, when it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would take us and teach us what it means to be a people who understand your rescue and your faithfulness to us how you have brought us to the places that we even are today. And we will learn through those things and that there are many of us who make vows and say rash things that you will take in the end. And if we will listen, we will, you'll move us to a place of full faithfulness in trusting who you are. So teach us to be a people who listen to the words that you say as you lead us to what we look at today. Amen. Have a seat if you were standing. <laughs> now, what we are at is in this section called Acts Part 
2. Acts part 2 is where we are walking through, looking mostly at the life of Paul. Uh, there are a few excursions, but now through the end of the book, it transitions to where Paul is going to go from trial to trial to trial, all the way through the end of the book where he will end up in this place called Rome. Now, just me saying he's going to get to Rome, it may take some of the scary bits out, like the shipwrecks and, and things like that, because he does survive. He will finally be beheaded, but that doesn't actually take place in the book of Acts. I'll give you some background about where we're at at this point, so you can kind of be up to speed if you've missed any of this. So so what has happened in the last few weeks is that Paul has gone into the temple to take place in a very Jewish rite that is a purification ritual. He does this because there are some leaders of the church in Jerusalem that say, if you would do this, it would placate some of the people who are around and they may not dislike you so much. People who are zealous for the law are saying some very negative things about Paul. So Paul does a very Jewish thing that would hopefully speak to the people who are zealous for the law. And it goes really poorly because even doing that Paul was not Jewish enough. A riot essentially breaks out and they attack Paul and he is being beaten which kind of should make you appreciate Paul a bit if you like UFC or ultimate fighting because Paul is a guy who could take a beating because it happened a lot. While he's getting beat up there's a guy named Claudius. He is a Roman tribune in charge of a lot of soldiers and he sees this guy being beat up and so he takes his soldiers out to protect this person. He wraps them in chains, thinking this person is an assassin out of Egypt, because why else would someone get beaten in the temple grounds? And he starts hauling this person, who we know as Paul, back to the barracks. As they're going to the barracks, Paul says, hey, could I say something to the crowd? And when Paul speaks Greek very well and very fluently, Claudius, this Roman tribune, says, sure, why not? So Paul then addresses the crowd. He addresses the crowd in Hebrew or Aramaic, which would have been kind of the form of Hebrew at the time of Paul. And because he's speaking the sacred tongue, everybody gets very quiet and they start to listen. As they listen, Paul tells his story about how zealous he was for the law and went out to try and kill Christians himself. And then Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. And after Jesus met him, he started to decide to follow Jesus himself. After this, God comes to Paul and he says, now I want you to take this message of grace and salvation also to the Gentiles. When that crowd hears that God told Paul to also take that message to the Gentiles, they once again go crazy and a second riot takes place and Claudius, that Roman tribune, has to once again save Paul. So twice now, in the period of probably just an hour, he has saved Paul. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 22. Now, Claudius is most likely trying to find out what in the world is going on because all these words about Jesus and Paul and resurrection and God's call and new life and Gentiles all sounds pretty meaningless to him. He doesn't understand the religious and cultural context. So what he does is the next day, Acts 22 verse 30, says, desiring to know the real reason why he, that's Paul, was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priest and all the council to meet. That is the Jewish ruling council known as the Sanhedrin. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. Claudius is coolest, so he's trying to figure out what's going on. He brings all these people together so he can get to the bottom of it. Now, as this encounter starts, Paul sees the Sanhedrin. Many of them were probably people that he studied with under his own rabbi Gamaliel. And what Paul starts is with, oh, brothers, thank goodness it is you. You know me and my life and how I lived. So Paul's like, this might actually go better than I thought. As soon as he says that the high priest has someone punch Paul in the face to make him shut up. And so Paul is like, well, apparently this is not going to go as I thought it was going to go. So what Paul does, he sizes up the room, Acts now 23, verse 6, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out to the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And what Paul does there is he puts the Pharisees and the Sadducees at odds with one another in this council. And they start to fight each other all over this thing called the resurrection, which is the central part of Paul's message. And they, then they start fighting so bad that Paul was about to be torn in two once again. And then Claudius, the Roman tribune, for the third time now, has to rescue Paul from the mob and take him back to the Roman barracks. 
And I assume that Claudius is pretty much in despair because he doesn't know what to do. He wanted to beat the truth out of Paul, but Paul's a Roman citizen, so he can't do that. And at this point, everybody's unhappy in the entire situation. Uh, Claudius has to hold Paul without any charges and risk consequences. And so Claudius isn't happy, and Paul's not happy, and the Jews aren't happy, and the Christians aren't happy. There's only one person in the entire text that we see who is actually happy. You know who it is? It's not the devil. It's actually Jesus. In Acts 23, verse 11, it says, The following night the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And those facts are about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, what we call the gospel, the announcement of that good news. The word courage there, it means to be of good cheer. It means to take comfort. Jesus says to Paul, all these things are going on, but you are exactly where I want you to be. So do not be discouraged, because you are going to be my witness. And I know many times when our life is crazy and things we don't understand, like COVID and, and all of that, we love for Jesus to show up and let us know that we are where we are supposed to be. We think it's great, but the word in, in Greek for witness is actually this word called martyr, called martyr. It's not so comforting when you understand how eventually Paul in his life will testify about Jesus because he'll testify by his own death. Again, not in the book of Acts, that will come later. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Paul says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And this is what you will see Paul do throughout the book of Acts. No matter what situation he finds himself in, he will encourage those around him to follow Jesus and to trust Jesus. I think a good question for us when we look at Paul's life is how do we respond? to hardship what do we do with it do we melt down in our lives or do we trust Jesus throughout the midst of it and in the midst of those hard things do we then encourage others to trust and love Jesus and walk with him do we lash out at the government do we lash out at one another do we say oh this is so unfair I think one of the things that COVID might do that's really good for us is it might give us a better picture of who we are so that we can see that the fact that Paul is now a prisoner may look like a hindrance to the spread of the good news, but God is in control, and it's not a hindrance to the spread of the good news. God is going to do something with it. Now, how is that going to take place? Well, Paul is intensely hated by many of these people who are zealous for the law. Wherever he went, his life was in danger. And today you're going to see how a group of people decide they're going to take a vow to try and kill him. But now he's a prisoner. He is actually directly under the protection of Roman soldiers. His companions will get to visit him. It does stink to lose your freedom, but it is also a blessing of God for Paul. God used the government at this point to keep Paul safe to bring about what God intended to do. And this is the whole idea of where Acts kind of starts to go now, that God keeps us where he wants us to be, that no matter what happens, God will move us where he needs us to be to bring about his purposes, even though some people will make some rash vows and want to kill Paul. Now, here's a question for us as we walk into this. Have you ever made a rash vow? Like maybe you know someone who met someone and they got married really, really quick and their life became a total mess. Or maybe you were on vacation and you got vacation brain and you went to some timeshare and you got suckered in and you bought a timeshare in a place you would never go on vacation again. Or you ever take a job because it offered more money and then you realize you just took a job for the devil, metaphorically. And then all your coworkers are like demons who stab you all day long with their pitchforks metaphorically. If it's real, quit. Go find another job. Anyway, once when I was in high school, I, I was a total idiot. Not that it ever wore off. I think it just got worse as I got older. But my mom had this sixth sense when I did something stupid, uh, like, like a radar or momdar or dumdar. I, I don't know. Uh, she always had this also bizarre clean freak streak where everything had to be spotless in the house. 
And so one day, it's like Saturday or Sunday, I don't know, she comes into my room, which is really her room because she paid the bills, not me, and she's vacuuming. I thought it was 5 a.m. It was probably like 9 or 10 or something like that. But I had a hard night of doing all the things that high school kids are not supposed to do. So I wasn't thinking very clearly. She's vacuuming me, and I jump out of bed. I'm like, what are you doing? And she shuts off the vacuum, and she's like, where were you? How come you're out so long? You're grounded two weeks. Now, you got to understand, when my mom is not like some of your pansy parents, when they said you're grounded two weeks, they let you off in two hours because they want to be your buddy and they're afraid to hurt your feelings. That is not my mom. My mom took pride in how she would keep you grounded the whole two weeks. And so I did something rash. I argued, which if you know my mom, it's also something you don't do with her. So I yell, two weeks, how dare you? And she says, you want three? And at this point, I don't really know what's going on and what I got to lose. So I go, yeah. And she goes, well, you're grounded three weeks. And I go, three weeks? You can't do that. She says, you want four? What do you think I said? Yeah, that's what I said. She said, you're grounded four weeks. And I said, four weeks. And at this point, I had fully lost my mind, just completely. And she looks at me. She goes, you want five? And I was like, what the heck? Sure, I'll take five. It is the dumbest argument strategy in the history of the world. Don't ever try this, especially with my mom. She said, you got five weeks. And indignantly, I'm like, five weeks? How dare you? And she said, you want six? You know what I said? No, that's what I said. And she kept me grounded five weeks, never off for good behavior. I could have been grounded too, but my emotion got the better of me. I made these rash statements. Has that ever happened to you? And if you have lunch with your family or maybe your GC gets together for something, whether it's a Zoom call or lunch or dinner this week, talk to one another about maybe the things you've said or done when you are too emotional to stop. If you look at studies, they will actually show that this gets even worse in a crowd. Look at some of the riots that are taking place today where people will burn down their own neighborhood. And a couple weeks later, they're like, why in the world do we even do that? There are studies about this that say, show that we get more rash and more dumb when we're in a crowd. And I'm not saying you can't and don't do stupid things you regret on your own. Go to that website, eat that thing, buy that thing, post that comment. But things to get tend to get a lot worse when you run with idiots that you call friends. Uh, Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And you can see how this plays out and what the Jews decide to do today. I'll get to that in just a second. But it's also kind of like political fervor, and there's no stopping the crazy, some of the COVID decisions that people are making. Like, I know relatively intelligent people who are on Facebook. I have personally stopped looking at Facebook right now because I can't handle all that, all that stuff. Uh, but there is a, a whole little pro-life thing that came about where someone uh, replied to a comment and just said, hey, you know, why don't we have a civilized conversation about this where we respect one another and, and talk about this? And the vehement replies that came back to this person where somebody eventually said, I'm going to come to your house and bash your brains in with a bat. And people thumbed up that. How do people even think that's okay? Bashing someone in is heads in with the bat. How, why does that even seem like it's okay to do? Because you're in the crowd and everybody's cheering you on. You think it becomes normal. Daniel Richardson has done extensive research into this. And this is what he says. We think of the internet as an information superhighway. It's not. It's a bias superhighway. Twitter and Facebook are wonderful ways of sharing information, but it may be that because we are sharing our prejudices, they're making us dumber. So what kind of crazy will people do in a crowd? Acts 23 Verse 12, when it was day, this is the day after Paul had his first little trial where they punched him in the face, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There are more than 40 who made this conspiracy. I mean, think about that. You're sitting around together. What are we going to do? How are we going to get him? Well, let's, let's do this. That's not good enough. Let's make an oath not to eat or drink anything till we kill him. Yeah, that's a good one. And 40 people go, yeah, let's, let's do that. Verse 14, they went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you along with the council give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. These are experts in the law who love God. So they say, lie, and we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So these words, we have strictly bound ourselves. That word in Greek is the word anathema. And what it, it's so strong, it means that there is no hope of redemption if we don't follow through with our vow. 
Can you imagine how that even comes about? Harvard psychologist Solomon Ash demonstrated that people will frequently adopt the view of the majority even when it is obviously wrong. Reed Tudenham is at the University of California. So he tried a little study. Uh, he's, he puts you know, plants in his classroom who would just shout out really stupid answers to questions and then saw what people who didn't know what was going on, what they would answer. And he got some of the craziest things where people would start to agree with the majority of people throwing out just dumb answers, one of which is male babies will only live to be 25 years old. And all these people are like, yeah, that's true. And they're oh, OK. And they just start agreeing. It's so weird. Uh, George Carlin, I don't know if you can quote him in church, but I'm going to. George Carlin once said, never underestimate the power of stupid people in large groups. Totally true. And th there are things when Luke writes this that you're supposed to take notice of and how he relates it. The first one is this. He is contrasting the rash vows of these men with Paul's vow of going into the temple for a purification ritual, trying to connect to those who are zealous for the law in order to bring people together for the cause of Christ. He goes to the temple to religiously walk through this vow with four men, and now these other people are taking a vow to kill Paul. The second thing you're supposed to see is that when they first arrested Paul, the Romans thought that he was an assassin. And now these Jews themselves have become the assassin. It's to help the reader see the hypocritical nature of the charges of those who were zealous against law, that all those charges they had against Paul should have been leveled against themselves. But as often happens, we go so far down our rabbit holes that we stop seeing God and what he intends for us in his life and how his spirit intends for us to live. We stop seeing those things. So here again, God is going to do a miraculous thing to save Paul using the government. Okay, verse 16. Now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. So he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring you this young man, this young man to you, as he has something to tell you. The tribune took him by the hand and going aside asked him privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than forty of the men are lying in ambush for him who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him and now they are ready waiting for your consent so the tribune dismissed the young man charging him tell no one that you have informed me of these things now you learn something here in the bible you don't learn anywhere else that paul is a sister and she has a son and they live in jerusalem we don't know if paul had lots of family members there or not if they were christians or not most likely they weren't and they might have been irritated at paul who started off as just you know the epitome of a pharisee and then he becomes a christian but they're still family so they care about him all we really know is the same night that Paul gets a vision where Jesus stands beside him and says, you're going to go to Rome, I'm going to make sure you get there. That same night, his nephew happened to be at the right place at the right time to hear about the rash vows to kill Paul. And some people say, ooh, my goodness, that's such a coincidence. Ooh, that's such good luck. Guys, we don't believe in coincidence or luck. We believe in the providence of God, and this is the providence of God. One writer says that in the Middle East, they have what they call Arabic telephone. One person tells another and another and another, and pretty soon everybody just knows everything. So there's probably a dinner and you know, some family sitting around, and the kid's like, Dad, why aren't you eating? And the mom's probably like, well, he took a, a vow. He's going to kill that troublemaker, Paul, and he's not going to eat until he does. Oh, and that kid tells a kid, tells another kid, and eventually it gets to Paul's nephew. Verse 23, then he, that's Claudius, that Roman tribune again, called two of the centurions and said, and centurions are in charge of a hundred soldiers, get ready two hundred soldiers with seventy horsemen and two hundred spearmen as, and go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also, provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. So again, here he is going to save Paul. And he wrote a letter to this effect. Claudius Lysias, to His Excellency the Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. 
So he kind of flips it all on its head because he only learned Paul's Roman citizen was when he was about to beat him. Here he's like, oh, no, I found this out. Aren't I so great? Give me a promotion. <laughs> and desiring to know the charge for which they're accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. And I'm sure Claudius is like, got rid of that guy. Thank God, if I went to go sleep like a baby. Verse 31. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. That's actually about 40 miles. And imagine you're a foot soldier at that time. This is not a fun job to have. On the next day, they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with him. When they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. On reading the letter, he asked what province he was from. And when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. Now, it's also funny. The guards who just a few days before this were going to torture Paul have now turned into Paul's protector. Uh, the people who want him dead, they're probably sitting there waiting for Paul to come down the street on their way to meet the Sanhedrin. And then the whole night goes by. And then the next day goes by. And probably pretty soon they're going, what in the world's going on? Where's Paul? How how we're supposed to get get to Paul? What what are we gonna do? And then a few more days go by, and they're probably starving, thinking, "Oh my goodness, what what have I done?" I mean, think about this: two hundred soldiers, seventy horsemen, two hundred spearmen. When when the Romans did something, they did it all the way. And Paul's a Roman citizen, so they're gonna make sure he is actually kept safe. Claudius again writes that letter. He omits all the parts where he tied Paul up in chains and was about to beat him because he doesn't want the governor or anybody else to know that he almost flogged Paul before he found out he was a Roman citizen. So he switches all of those events. Again, it's probably hoping to get a promotion and get out of this country called Israel because it was driving him crazy and he didn't understand anything. But the heart of the letter that he sends to Felix, the governor, Luke is trying to emphasize that, that Paul is being accused of things in regard to the Jewish law. And he says, but my judgment as a Roman official is that he deserves neither death nor imprisonment. And these are the same things that all the rulers say when they get Paul on trial. You'll see this throughout the rest of the book of Acts, that they're always like, I don't even know why you're on trial, Paul. But you will see this in places even previously, in Corinth and Philippi and Thessalonica, happens sort of a way in the city of Ephesus. And it keeps going on, which goes back to what is Luke trying to tell us? What is Luke trying to show us throughout the book? What he is showing is God's faithfulness to his people, even in hardships that we don't understand. And you will see this more and more as the book goes on. But I really kind of want to focus on throughout the end of this message is to talk about those rash vows. Because if you're like me, I read this story and I think, well, what happened to those Jews who made those rash vows? You know, where, where are they are? Because you can go several days without food, but not much longer than that without water. They're probably hungry and agitated. They maybe go back to the, the chief priests and they say, okay, you got to do something to let me get to Paul. Because the chief priest won't even make it to Felix the governor for five days. So they'll be sitting there five days. And then Paul will actually be held there for two years. It would be two years before they ever got the chance to try and ambush Paul. So what happened to them? Well, uh, few commentators, if any, actually believe that these guys starved to death. I mean, there really are essentially four things that could have happened. Number one, they died, which would be A, funny, B, sad, and C, fitting. Uh, the second thing that could have happened is the high priest could have found a legal loophole for them and pardoned them from their rash vow. The third thing is that most of these guys were zealous for the law. They may have been law experts, so they may have even made an exemption for themselves, like we all do when we make promises and then say, I don't really want to follow through on that. I don't really want to do that. The point of it all is that they're probably ultra-Orthodox experts in the law. They keep saying how much they want to honor God's law above everything, and yet you see them lie to get to Paul. And it's kind of a little interesting irony that they're probably trying to explain to their own consciences how their most solemn oath, the anathema, didn't mean what they said it means. Or, fourthly, they admitted they were wrong. And that is really one of the hardest things for people to do, is simply to admit when we are wrong. Now, especially if the majority of the crowd around us disagrees and thinks, oh, no, no, you, you, were, you were right. The interesting thing about this section of Scripture is that so many of us live our lives like the people who made those rash vows. It's like me arguing with my mom about how many weeks I was, I was going to be grounded. I, I had all these rash things I was doing, and I destroyed all of my teenage freedom. 
We will live our lives making dumb decision after dumb decision after dumb decision. And too often, we think that the answer to our dumb decision is to double down on the dumbness and not just say we're wrong. Some people will keep dating the same type of person over and over and over, and it always goes horribly wrong eventually. And yet the answer isn't to date something different, somebody different. It's that they haven't found the right jerk yet. Some people smoke and drink too much, and it destroys their life. And their answer isn't to stop. It's to smoke or drink something different. I need a little more weed. I need a different type, type of booze. Some people will spend their life running from God's call. And they will consistently and constantly destroy their lives. And yet the answer isn't to stop following your heart. It's that you haven't, your heart hasn't figured out who you really are yet. You haven't been listening enough to your heart in the midst of that. And it is all dumb. It's just like the guys who wanted to kill Paul. And this is the problem for us as Christians. Because we say we love Jesus, we say we believe the gospel, but so often we think the gospel and God's rescue of us cannot truly be the answer. It has to be found in some created thing, uh, some person, some book, some movement. It has to be in that. It's like how Solomon in Ecclesiastes, he goes and he searches for all these things, thinking the answer cannot actually be found in God himself. It has to be in something else. But in the end, all of our schemes and rash vows are meaningless. And this is why God is a God of grace. Too often for people around us, God's grace seems so foolish, especially to people who haven't been honest enough about their own stupidity and calling it what it is, rash and dumb. But this is why Jesus has to step into our mess to rescue us. We could not save ourselves, even from ourselves. It's, it's kind of sad to me that it breaks my heart a bit that I talk to people who speak of how overbearing and constrictive they think faith in Jesus is. And yet they will run off and they will bind themselves to relationships and things and jobs and money and a zillion other things that will capture their heart and actually bind them into slavery. And all the while their friends are like, yeah, that Christianity thing's stupid. Well, they're all bound to all these things that are such slavery. And Christ actually wants just to set us free. So we can be the people he made us to be. Element, as a church, you know, we must be a people who are honest enough to admit who and what we were before God himself rescued and saved us. We must admit that in front of other people. We don't have it all together, and that's okay. What we need to be is a people who step into other people's lives in a way that centers itself on the gospel, that actually brings about real community, that our relationships We'll start to be more wise and then more stupid that we would talk about where the dumbness is and where the wisdom is in following God. I mean, what if we as a people actually not just say we believe the good news, but actually lived that good news? What if we lived that out, that God has taken all of our rash vows and set them aside in order to redirect us to his grace? This is the people we must become those who trust him more than ourselves, because our God has come to break our chains to sin and restore us to grace. And yet so often we are a people who cling so strongly to our chains, so strongly to the things that will complete us, so strongly to the things that we think make us who we are. And yet in the end, all of those things end up actually destroying us. And our great God who loves us has come to us for a purpose to set us free that we get to live in this great joy of what freedom actually brings. I mean, this is one of the reasons that Element, you know, we talk about communion every week. I mean, I know you can't take it here, but if you're at home, you could, you could take bread if you're so inclined, or wine or grape juice. And what that is, it's a reminder of what God did to rescue us from the chains that held us down, from all the rash vows we've made to ourselves or other people, that he has broken those and set us free to actually be as image bearers, as people in this world again. I mean, God loves us more than we could ever, ever imagine. And I think when we get a little glimpse of that, we can, in communion, we get a glimpse of that. How much he actually does love and how much he actually does care about us. And I would invite you where you are, if you'd like to, that you could take communion. If you need prayer and you're watching on the live stream, on the, on the side, you can actually put in a prayer request. You can send a request to connectedourelement.org. If you would like someone to call you and pray with you, we would be more than willing to do that as well. We just want to make sure that if you have something that's going on in your life and you would like prayer for that, we'd love to be there for you. Maybe you're in in a place today where you have made some rash vows and you just feel like, I cannot step back from those. What would people think if if I step back from these things? Well, you know what? What matters is what God thinks. And God loves you. And he cares about who you are. So we set aside all of those rash things to trust him and his rescue 
of us. And if you guys, you know, God has given so much to us, so giving is simply part of our worship at Element. You can, you can do that online. You can mail a check. You can do whatever you, whatever you want. But Element is a church who still gives to other people, people who find themselves in bondage in, in a lot of places because we want to be God's hands and feet to this world. And I would encourage you this week to talk to some people about some of the rash vows that you made in your life and maybe also the ways that you've seen God come and set you free. Or maybe if there is something in your life that you're just so bound to and you don't know how to get out because it would change everything in your life, talk to some people about that. Ask some really good, honest questions about all of that so we would truly be a people who trust God's great rescue of us over and above everything. Why don't you guys pray with me? Uh, Father, I ask that you would take us and help us to be a people who see who you are calling us to be. That we don't have to be a people who live in despair because we don't know who you are, but we can be a people who live in great hope because of who you've called us to be. Father, so often it is easy to get so stuck in our own headspace, so much so that, that we don't hear your leading and your guidance. And I ask that today you would break through that, that your spirit would do an amazing work in us so we would hear your call as you bring us back to yourself. And you would take all the rash things that we have said and done and you would teach us to be honest about them. We would call them for what they are, foolish. And yet we wouldn't let that then then define us. We would let who you call us to be define us, that you are the one who has come to rescue and call us back to yourself. And so teach us to be a people then who understand that ourselves and we would speak that out into the world. The great freedom that we have known because our God stepped into this world to rescue us. And we would live lives that bear that out by everyone we come into contact with. That they would know the great freedom that you have called us as a people to live in. And that we would trust you for all that we are because you are so good to us. We ask this in your son's good name. Amen. Like deer to the fold, I'm coming after you. Like a thirsty animal, my heart is Like Jonah from the deep, I'm coming out of my sleep to find the secrets that you keep is the only thing worth rising for. From the dirt you draw me out and you draw me back again.
With the melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemy until all my fears are gone and I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God And I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God
child of God. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, I am a child of God. Lord, I pray that you would help us to recognize when we have been trying to follow our own will and not yours, that we would be willing to admit when we are wrong, when we have not sought after the things that you want for us. I just pray that you would help us know what your will is for our lives and uh, that our hearts would be drawn to you and that our hearts would run after all the things that you want for us and run after you. In your name, amen. All right, everybody, we got one more song. I really miss you guys a lot. Um, So I guess... Something I was thinking about is uh, my favorite thing when we're leading worship is when I can hear the congregation over the band when everybody's singing and they're, you're louder than us. It's like the best feeling I've ever had in a worship service. And I miss that so much. And I know you're not here, but you're at home. So I'm just going to ask for you guys at home. Maybe you're just humming on the couch like I do. But for this one, get up and sing along with us, all right?
You've been chasing after us All the walls are coming down Scattered far across the ground When we hear you coming round You've been chasing after us Like a rolling stone, like a runaway train No turning back, no more yesterday I sit on the stool, are you gonna have little short legs on the stool? <laughs> ta da! Here we go, ta da! And ta da! And who's doing this? Me! No, the dino! <laughs> no, the dino! Oh my god! Oh my god.